No one has any idea what news the day can bring. One report, one phone call can change everything for you. That's what happened to us last night. What if you found out that you only had months to live? What if you found out that you had a terminal disease? What if you get a terminal diagnosis with months to live and you're still young? You still have decades to live in your life. Think of it just for a moment. You realize I'm young and I'm dying soon. What do you do? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about when the doctor says you have only months to live. As some of you are going like, oh, this is Memorial Day and this is what we're speaking on today. This is my promise. My promise is this. You may not come here and like what you're going to hear, but you'll always hear the truth. That I can promise you here. Emily Phillips shocked America with just a few words as a tweet went viral a few years ago. Emily Phillips had more life to live and was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. The Florida woman nearing the end of her life tweeted these words that literally caught the soul of America and the world. This is what she tweeted. I was born, I blinked, and it was over. Those are her words. Because that's the part that is so important for us to understand the brevity of life. The message is intense as we are just a few weeks away from concluding the prayer series. But I would be remiss to leave out this story of King Hezekiah who is responsible for this prayer series. Because we're coming to what it seems like the possible sudden end of his life. The 40 year old looks like it may be over for him. Because it's the sudden terminal diagnosis of Hezekiah is recorded, this is what's remarkable, in three different places in the Bible. It's all the same story, but told from a different perspective. It's told in 2 Kings chapter 20. It's told again in 2 Chronicles 32. And you read the story of this diagnosis, this terminal diagnosis, in Isaiah chapter 38. It is, it is something that you have to, when the Bible gives us a story three times, the same story, it has to catch us and we have to take notice of it. But like the first story of Hezekiah that kicked off this prayer series, Because You Prayed, it was, that was in three different places. So is this story. The first story that Israel's existence was threatened by the Assyrian army and a praying king prays, dispatches one angel from heaven that rescues the nation. And Isaiah the prophet looks at him and says, because you prayed, the nation has been saved. The prophet says to Hezekiah, his prayer life brought deliverance. Now our king is around 40 years old. He is on a roll of seeing victories in the kingdom, victories in his nation, victories all around him. And then let me read to you the words that changes everything. The phone call, the doctor's report, the diagnosis. Let me read to you Isaiah's version. This is what it says. Isaiah 38, 1. And in those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. This is the praying king. This is the man that rescued a nation. This is not supposed to happen to him. The diagnosis is terminal. Set your house in order is, is serious. You shall die and not live is sobering and grave. And those are the words that this man hears. Two stories that the Bible feels like. I've got to say that, that the Holy Spirit says, I've got to say it three different times, three different ways from three different perspectives. And so today, you're gonna, you may feel uncomfortable hearing this topic you can even be in this place and be somewhat dismissive. But I'm telling you, you are going to pay attention to this topic at some point in your life. J. John is considered the Billy Graham of the United Kingdom. And he's a friend of Times Square Church. God has used him powerfully to not only preach all over the United Kingdom, but every time he comes here, the, the messages are so powerful. 
He was here the last Tuesday he was here. He then stayed over and spoke to our staff on a Wednesday and taught me something after 40 plus years of ministry that has helped me. If you're a leader that's sitting in this place or watching um, or, or watch, watching it live or at some point during the week, I want you to hear this valuable lesson. During our staff Q&A with J. John, he answered a question of what to say to somebody who gets a bad report from the doctor. He says, there are two questions to ask to those that have a bad doctor's report. And this, to me, was priceless. It was wisdom for me in, in ministry, as well as it can be for all of you. This is what he said. When somebody comes to him and says, this is what the doctor said. When he gets a Hezekiah report, uh, just like Hezekiah, set your house in order for the, it, your, your time is going to be very limited. This is what J. John says. He says, I ask two questions. Here are the two questions. Don't miss this. He says, one, do you think God is calling you home or do you think you have more race to run? Those are great questions to ask. He says, one, do you think God is calling you home or two, do you think you have more race to run? This is what he said. If the answer to the first one is yes, God is calling me home, then J. John said, he said, then let me help you finish strong. Let's finish the race with our heads held high, our hands lifted up, because we're getting ready to go meet Jesus. But he said, but if the answer is, I still feel in my soul, there's more race for me to run, then he says this, then let's fight for your healing. Let's pray that every force of hell will be broken and that healing power of Jesus would come to your life today. I love that. See, what he was saying was, and what we all need to know is, we must all know that as we approach the end, keep this in mind, God is real. The Bible is true. Time is brief. Life is exciting. But we know that heaven must be my home. And that's what is always important. But here's the good news. As a Christian, it's always a win-win experience. Which means... If the doctors, if Jesus says, I'm calling you home, I win. That's what I've been wanting to do the whole time. There are certain weeks that people go, how are you feeling? I said, I can't wait to see Jesus. And there are other weeks that you're just going, listen, I have a fight inside of me. So if God heals me, I win. If I'm going called home, I win. I'm a Christian and it's always a win-win experience in God. I have to tell you about a text that I got that, I, that, that if you just looked at it with, with just the, um, from with your natural eye, it would almost be odd to see it. But really, it was unique and courageous. I got it just a few days ago from a pastor that over the years has been a hero to me. John left a growing, thriving church in Michigan. He felt that in the middle of this growth spurt that was happening, God was calling him to the inner city and to work with children. He left everything. Went not only to work with children, but was attending our church in Detroit. And him and his wife, just incredible people, and his staff, they'd come every Sunday, but the entire week, they were ministering to thousands of kids in this area. What was amazing was this, or what was even both amazing and sad, the text was amazing, but what began to bring even just a, a, a reminder to me was is that while they were even sitting there and ministering, it was John's wife that got cancer and I had to do her funeral. And then while I, after I did her funeral, I watched all these children that they poured into over the years come and to pay respects to this great woman of God. And so John, who became a widower for some years, I get this text from John just a few days ago. I have to read it to you. I put it on the screen so you're gonna see it. He says, this is just a few days ago. He goes, hi Tim, don't be alarmed, I'm good, but I have a request. When the time comes for me to cash out, would you honor me by preaching my home going? I'm, I'm just going like, who sends texts like this? He says, I know, he goes, I know that schedule could make it impossible, but if you could do it, 
I'd appreciate it more than you know. Pray you, Cindy, and the kids are blessed and doing well. Love you, man, John. So my response was this. John, honor to do it. Just don't die on Easter Sunday because it's very busy during that weekend of the year. And he said he would try his best. Can I, can I help you for a moment? Whether you want to hear this or not, we're all terminal. Folks, we all are. So, so don't play around like, I'm going to live for, I don't, I don't care what you do to extend. You can go like, no, 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 you don't understand. I work out. Let, let me just tell you something. You can go, you can go to Planet Fitness and eat tofu or Twinkies. Listen to me carefully. We are all terminal in this place. All of us are. But if you're a Christian, it's a win-win scenario for us in this place. When a diagnosis comes like Hezekiah had, or even today, when I finished preaching this message at the first service, I got a text from a, from a, a different part of the nation that just said, thank you for saying this. My, and then just related to me, a text a family member got just a few days ago, terminal, pancreatic cancer, and just hearing it. But understand, if we're all terminal, some learn about their ending date, their final date, with a little bit of accuracy more than anybody else, like Hezekiah did with the Hezekiah diagnosis. Hezekiah's recording of this moment, I have to read this to you, it, it, it is life is insightful. I didn't even realize until I started diving into this that his, his thoughts, like what hit him when this started to happen is recorded in the scripture. He, because Hezekiah puts, Isaiah puts down what Hezekiah was not only thinking, but it almost seems like we're getting like a, a little bit from his diary, from something he wrote down. I want to read it to you. It's in Isaiah 38. Listen to these, these words in verse 9. It says, this is what Hezekiah, king of Judah, wrote after he had been sick and recovered from his sickness. Listen to verse 10. In the very prime of life, I have to leave. Whatever time I have left is spent in death's waiting room. No more glimpses of God in the land of the living. No more meetings with my neighbors. No more rubbing shoulders with friends. This body I inhabit is taken down and packed away like a carp camper's tent. Like a weaver, I've rolled up the carpet of my life as God cuts me free of the, free of the loom and at a day's end sweeps up the scraps and pieces. I cry for help until morning like a lion. God pummels and pounds me relentlessly, finishing me off. I squawk like a doomed hen, moan like a dove. My eyes ache from looking up for help. Master, I'm in trouble. Get me out of this. But what's the use? God himself gave me the word. He's done it to me. I can't sleep. I'm that upset. I'm troubled. Man, that's raw. Like you're reading, you're hearing this man's heart. Like, I, I, I didn't even realize, and I, man, I've been studying the word for decades. I didn't even realize that this, this is in the Bible. Of what a man, when you get a diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis, this is what he was feeling. Hezekiah, as I said, is believed about, to be about 40 years old when he got the news about his health. That comes from verse 10. It says in one version, I'm in the middle of my life and I'm about to enter the gates of Sheol. You know, there's a song that we sing here. And as I was reading and studying, man, I started to sing it all week long. It's written by Matt Redman. It's called 10,000 Reasons. How many have heard that song before? And I just, I, I kept thinking, because every time we sing that song, there's like this, it's such a powerful song. You, you, you know the song. It goes, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his whole. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship his holy name. Remember how the song starts? It's like this, this fighting part. It goes like this. The sun comes up. It's, uh, it's time to sing your song again. Your song, whatever may pass. Let 
let me be singing when the e. Now that is so powerful. Like when we start singing that, I'm going like, whatever comes my way, I'm singing at nighttime to Jesus. I love that song. Until you get to that last part of the song, I'm going, ooh. I don't know if I like when we sing that song, that part, because it's all good about get through the battle, sing for joy at nighttime. And then you get to this part when it says, and on that day. Yep, this is, this is Hezekiah now. Sing it. The end draws me. Ooh, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise on 10,000 years. Come on, sing the chorus with me. Bless the Lord. Sing it, church. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. I'll worship your holy name. Some of you forgot how sobering that last part is. When the end draws near, and, that, and you're, you're singing that like all joy. But when the end draws, I'm, I'm like, are you out of your mind? That's scary. And you're singing it with joy, but maybe we're supposed to. Because it is a win-win situation for us. That whether, here's the good news, whether we're singing that on 51st and Broadway or at the throne of heaven, we're still going to be singing and that's what brings joy to our hearts. It's amazing that the psalmist says something interesting for all of us to consider. Almost lets us know the age group that Matt Redman is talking about when you get to that final day and on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and it's the psalmist in chapter 90 that gives us insight of how old that person is that Matt Radman, Radman is writing about listen to the words the psalmist says as for the days of our life they contain 70 years if you have a lot of strength 80 years yet their pride is but labor and sorrow for soon it is gone and we fly away Think of that for a moment and how true it is. Written thousands of years ago, it says that we have an expectancy of 70 years. If you're strong and if, and if you have health, 80. And if you go beyond 80, those are bonus years. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm going, man, I feel strong. I'm 60 years old. That means, okay, here's what's sobering. Okay, don't clap. Okay, I'm... I'm I'm 60 years old. According to Psalm 90, verse 10, you ready for this? I've lived 75% of my life. 75%. So that's why when I sing that last verse of bless the Lord, oh my soul, I'm singing it as a 75 percenter. I'm going like the end draws near. And so I'm, I'm going, I'm 60 years old. By God's grace, maybe God will let me work till 80, not pastoring to lady. I'm not going to do that to you. But, but, but I'm, I want to be able to serve God and do all that I can for him. Because, because this is what I started to realize. I, I've got to face that sober truth. I can't, I can't be dismissive of this. You can't be dismissive of this. It's too important. I have to live my life like John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace. When he said these words, he goes, I'm like a person going on a journey in a stagecoach who expects its arrival at any hour. He says, I'm frequently looking out the window for it. I'm packed, sealed, and ready for the post. Which means my entire life, I'm going, God, is this the day? Is this the day? I'm ready. I want to always be ready. When God calls me home, I want to make sure that nothing is left undone. That I've obeyed his will. I've done exactly what God has called me to do. Now, for some of you that are sitting here, this may be uncomfortable talk. It may be talk that you're going like, man, what, what kind of church is this? That they would speak about, about death. Listen, if, if we speak it from a biblical standpoint, it's exciting to us then. 
Because on this topic, it is a sobering thing. It will, at times, help us to see the way we're supposed to see. One of, if anybody can speak about this, it was the great writer, Corey Temboon, who was part of hiding Jews during the Nazi takeover of the Netherlands of, in her hometown of Amsterdam. Um, our, our general overseer, Pastor Carter, was just in Amsterdam, and now he's going over to Cairo, Egypt, to do a leaders conference in Egypt, and we want to be praying for him. But I, he sent me a text of, of him in the hiding place where Corey was hiding the, the Jews at the watch store right there in Amsterdam. And Corey Timboon and her dad, in the middle of all this, Corey Timboon says, I remember an incident when I asked my father, I'm afraid that I will never be strong enough to die as a martyr. She was, she was facing that fear. It was uncomfortable to her. And this is what her dad said. He said, Corey, when you have to go on a journey, when do I give you the money for the fare on the train? Two weeks before? She goes, no, Father, on the day that I'm leaving. And he says, exactly. And that's why our wise and loving Father in heaven knows when you're going to need the things that you do. When the time comes that he calls you home, then he'll give you the ticket and you will find the strength you need at the right time. Folks, that is amazing. You don't have to fear that you're going like, right now I'm afraid. Let me just tell you something. When God is going to get ready to call you home, he's going to give you a ticket and it's called peace. He's going to give you something and says, I'm going to give you strength right in the middle of all this. Don't allow the uncomfortableness to come in. Just go, God, you'll prepare me when the time is right. And I want to prepare you to finish strong. Or for some of you, I want to prepare you to fight for healing. Like J. John taught us. Some of you need to finish well, going, I have a peace that my time may be soon. My mom would say that to me. She goes, I'm ready. I'm ready to go home. And as a son, I didn't want to hear that. But I, but I knew that she was. She was at peace with that. And there are people that I talk to that have a diagnosis like Hezekiah, that they go, I feel like there's more race to run. Then I said, then we're going to fight for healing. We're going to fight for that way. Hezekiah chose to fight. And let me talk to you about that fight for just a second. I want to read to you what happens. When he gets the diagnosis, it was as if maybe Isaiah came in and used the J. John question. Hezekiah, let me ask you a question. Is it time to go home or do you still have more race to run? And it seems like Hezekiah felt like I've got more race to run. Let me read to you what happens next. Verse 2. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Here comes the fight. And said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart. I've done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. This is the man that gave him the diagnosis, the terminal diagnosis, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, and I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Folks, that's amazing to me. I'm going, this is the man that said, I think I've got more years. I think I'm going to fight. I think I'm going to fight for this. He prays, he fights, and God gives him 15 years. 15 years. But I have to read to you what happens from another part of the story, from the Second Chronicles portion. I need to read to you what happens. Because something, something goes a little awry here. Something went wrong after the miracle healing. It happens, it's so powerful that I feel like I can't gloss over it and just go, he's healed and so let's all pray for 15 more years. Just, not just yet. Let me read this to you, what happens. Here's the Chronicles version. But about that time, Hezekiah became deathly sick and he prayed to the Lord and the Lord replied with a miracle. Now look at verse 25. However, Hezekiah didn't respond with thanksgiving and praise. For he had become proud. And the anger of God was upon him. And upon Judah and Jerusalem. Folks this stood out to me. And you have to hear this for just a moment. God gave him 15 years. And he acted as though he deserved it. God gave him the gift of time. And Hezekiah dealt with it recklessly. Folks, can I just say something to you? When you don't show 
thanksgiving and praise. When you don't show gratitude, even in your worship, you're revealing to those around you and to heaven that you may be living selfishly and recklessly. Lack of worship means a lot more than I'm uncomfortable with lifting my hands. Let me just tell you something. If God gave me 15 more years tacked on, move out of the aisles because I'm running through this. Some of you are going like, I don't do that. We, we don't do that. I'm Catholic. I'm okay. Get enough of that. Don't be Catholic. Be, be, be thankful. Just as you go, I don't care what you are. It, this is a moment that God goes, I just gave you a gift. Can I just help you? And some of you are going like, well, I don't know if I have 15 more years, but here's what you do know. David says this in Psalm 103. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with him. Here it comes. And forget none of his benefits. Here's a thought for you. If you're walking, praise him. If you're breathing, praise him. If you can see, praise him. If you can stand, praise him. If you can lift your hands, praise him. But don't sit there like this because you think I don't have to do this. That's reckless. I'm telling you, the moment you walk through those doors, those hands should be raised and say, I've got too much from God for me just to sit here. Understand? When I'm sitting there watching that choir sing that song and going that, that God will rescue it all or Lion of Jude, I'm sitting there going like, I'm in the back going, yeah. How you can sit there, I don't understand it. But I'm telling you, we should be loud. Hands should be up. We should be going, God, you have been so good to me. God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. He's good. His mercy endures forever. He deserves our praise. He deserves it. Hallelujah. 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 Okay, sit down for five more minutes. Don't go anywhere, Joe. Welcome to Times Square Church. Okay. Listen, I, here's where I want to end it with. I live, I live in the city here. And we live in this apartment, not just Cindy and I, but all of the kids. And a dog. And it's, it's, it's all. But, but let me just say something. I know, I know. If we move out, we can get something a little bit bigger, and, but I have to commute in at that point. And here's, here's what I realize. I, 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 we don't own a car. Some of you are going like, oh, I can't believe he doesn't own a car. Well, I do. It's a whole fleet of yellow cars that I own. It's a fleet of them. Here's the great thing. I don't have to pay for gas or insurance, which is the greatest thing about it. Hey, or parking. Here's what's amazing. Cindy goes, what do you think about if we moved out and you commute in? I looked at her and I said, listen, listen to this man who 75% of his life is over. At a certain point, you realize this. Time is a bigger commodity than money, space, and even comfortability time is. I said, I don't know how much time God has. According to Psalm 90, seven, uh, 10 years, with strength, 20 years, with mercy, 25 years. And if you pray for Hezekiah 15, then I've got more years to go. But either way, I just kept thinking to myself, time is a big commodity. But here's the part I want you to get as we get ready to finish here. Listen very carefully about Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah goes, I'm going to fight. I'm going to ask for 15 years. This, I don't believe that this story is about getting simply more time to live, but I think it's a story about redeeming the time 
with the years that God gives to us. That's what it is. It's not, I, 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 I got to be true to what the word is teaching us. And I believe it's teaching us. It's not going, if you need healing, 15 for you, you get 15, you get 15, you get 15, you get 15. Listen, folks, I don't think it's that. I think it's God going, whatever I give to you, redeem the time. Redeem the time that God has given to you. Whatever that looks like. Because here's, here's, here's what it says. The Apostle Paul says it like this. See then you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know what redeem is? It means to rescue things from getting lost or rescue it from loss. It means that I'm going to rescue it from being wasted. That whatever God gives to me, I want to, I want to see it rescued. And I don't think it's about more time, but redeeming the time. Hezekiah's lesson is not if you're sick, you pray, you get 15 more years. Hezekiah's story is about redeeming the time, and I'm going to show you this, and using whatever God gives to us for his glory and his purposes. That's why I think when, when, he, when Isaiah says, get your house in order, I think, he, I think he was saying this, start redeeming the time. Whatever you have left, whether it's months or years, redeem, get your house in order, means that you would go ahead and say, Lord, let me make every day count. Hezek because Hezekiah prayed, he got an angel. Because Hezekiah prayed, he got 15 years. But I have this sense that Hezekiah should have prayed, if you give me more time, help me to redeem it. Help me not to waste 15 more years. Let's not simply ask for more, and we've not done what we're supposed to with what we have. Listen. For the man that defeated an enemy army could not defeat himself and his own selfishness. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing with the years that God has given to us? What are we doing with the money or the finances or the resources that God has given to us? What are we doing with that? That's why the psalmist, after he tells us about the years that we could have left, he goes on to say, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. That's redeeming talk. That's a redeeming sentence. Whether I'm going home to heaven or whether I'm healed, whatever you choose, God, help me redeem the time. See, what happens is when you don't give glory to God and grateful, when you don't redeem the time, here it comes. Listen, you will live recklessly and selfishly. When you don't look at life this way, you live selfishly. You live for self. See, this is what's crazy, is that his last 15 years were lived carelessly. The damage of Hezekiah's last 15 years was catastrophic for the future of his son and even the nation of Israel. He didn't redeem the time. And I have this sense that it may have started with, that he didn't start off with thanking God like that verse we read in 2 Chronicles 32, that when God blessed him, that his hands should have went up at that moment. Folks, I'm just telling you, whenever you see throughout the day that God does something, lift your hands and just say, thank you, God. Thank you for doing it. You know what that does? It, it Worship and gratitude protects you from selfishness and recklessness. Let me say that again. Worship and gratitude. A thank you, Jesus, protects you from selfishness and living recklessly. And I have this sense that when Hezekiah didn't do that, he started to live recklessly. Let me just give this to you and then close. Here it is. He gave the nation a horrible replacement king is what he does. He birthed Judah's most wicked king, Manasseh. That's his son, who, who not only was wicked, but killed Isaiah, the, the, the prophet, and gave Judah decades of bondage. He also cleared the way for the nation to backslide into idolatry. His horrible leadership as a king and father with a precursor to the nation's backsliding into immorality and idolatry. And finally, he lost the land to invaders. The nation of Israel lost its land to Persia and Babylon and its distinction. They were brought into, the cap in, into captivity for decades because of what he's done. He asked for 15 years. Look at me. He asked for 15 years and fumbled the ball. He got, God gave him something, and instead of treating it like, like a gift, like a gift, like thank you, God, thank you. Like when you walk in 
And the doctor says, this is what the diagnosis is. And you come back and he says, I can't seem to find it. At that moment, our hand should go up and say, God, thank you. Thank you. Every time you take a physical and the doctor just goes, hey, everything's clear. You, I, I don't care where you are. You could be sitting on that table with that, with that, with that kitchen paper on, on top of that thing, with that wax paper. That hand should go up and just go, hallelujah. Doc, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus is Lord of my life and he's the one who has given me health. Who cares what people think? Let gratitude always be the part. Let me, let me, let me finish here as the, as the band comes. You know, I, I want to give you something personal. I wrote these down and I'm going to share them with you. And it was something that, that has been so important to my life. Just recently, I just said, God, I want to finish well. As soon as I realized I only have 75% of my life is lived, I said, let me get this right, Lord. I just, I want to, I want to do what's right. So I did, I, I want to give to you something I wrote. It's kind of, I call it my mandate for today. I want to read it to you. I, and I want to, I want to just show you what I've been praying. And, and it's a deck, I, I prayed it this morning. This is, this is what I do. This is my mandate for today. I, I, this is what I started to realize. I said, God, here it is. Get ready for this. Take a picture of this. Today's a gift. Choose joy. Pray hard. Be thankful. Share Christ. Reflect love. Show generosity. Speak life. Live for his glory. And finish well. That's what I've asked God for. Let me, let me read it again. You know what? Read it with me out loud. Today's a gift. Choose joy. Pray hard. Be thankful, share Christ, reflect love, show generosity, speak life, live for his glory, and finish well. Hallelujah. That's it. That's my mandate. That's what I'm called to do. In fact, let me just, let me just here, here it is. This is what I wrote. I'm going to read to you what I, have, what I have written down. It's this. One, today is a gift. You said that already. Time is precious. Don't waste it. Choose joy. There are a lot of sad people in the world. I want to stand out. Smile at people all the time. Smile at people on the, on the C train. Smile at them on the B and the D. This is New York. They're going to think you're out of your mind. Just go ahead and just go. They don't care. They don't know. They don't know. Just do, just do it. Just smile at them. When you walk out of here, just smile at people as they're, as they're walking through. Number three, pray hard and pray every day. I need miracles every single day. And I want God involved in everything that I do. Number four, write this down. Four, go to the next one. Go to the next one. There you go. Say thank you a lot. I want to live a life of gratitude, not a life of entitlement. Just say thank you. When they give you your coffee, thank you. When they give you your bagel, thank you. We, we just, just say thank you a lot. This, this, it'll blow people away. Gratitude blows people away. Number five, win someone to Christ. I just want to get someone closer to heaven today. I just, I, whatever, whatever I can do. Here's the other one. Show the love of Jesus to anyone I come in contact with. Here it is. Be polite. Be friendly. Be gracious. Be generous. Okay, let me pause here for a second. If you eat lunch around this area, you better tip. You better tip good. Don't, don't say, oh, well, I prayed for them. That's their tip. No, 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 no. If you don't tip, please don't tell them you go to this church. Tell them you go somewhere else. Hey, just tell them the truth. I, tell, I, I told you this. You may not like us, but we'll always tell you the truth. Be generous. Be joyful and always be listening to people. Look them in the eye and listen. Give. This is the generosity one. I just said, God, help me to give to make a difference. You've blessed me with so much. Help me to be a blessing. I also said, I want to speak words of life in my conversations. Give me the right words that I can bring the dead to life. That's what I want to do. God, whatever I do, I want to do it for the glory of God. I'm reminded that even the little things, in fact, that's what the Bible says. Whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Just do it for the glory of God. So whether you're getting your meal today, we're going to do it for your glory. How do we do that? At least do this. Redeem the time. Let's just say thank. If you don't pray over your food, start there. If you don't pray as a family, just, and if, if you're going, well, I'm a little embarrassed because we haven't prayed for years over our food. Just go this. I, I have to pray. Pastor Tim is making me pray. Put it on me. I don't care. Put it on me. Just say, we're doing this. I'll take the hit. Just say, we're praying for our food today. 
Let the kids be shocked. Let your wife get slain in the spirit. And just go ahead and pray for the food. Just pray for the food. And finally, finish well. Finish well. There's a, there's a phrase that when you get to the end of your race, it's called the final kick. I said, God, give me a kick so I can sprint to the finish line. I remember the old, the old gospel song. I've come this far by faith. Let me sprint till I'm done. That's what I've been asking God to help me. You know what this kind of mindset does? It makes you think about the right things. I think it was an old Puritan writer. I couldn't find, I couldn't find where I wrote this down or who, who said it, but he said this, if you attempt to talk with a dying man about sports or business, he's no longer interested. He now sees other things as more important. People who are dying recognize what we often forget. We are standing on the brink of another world. Folks, all of us are on the brink of another world. When I look up here at these young people, JD is 24, Noah's 21. David, how old are you? 24 years old. They're babies. They're babies. They got, they got, they got, I, 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 they got 75% of their life to live. Redeem the time. I'm not even going to ask Joe. I'm not even going to ask Barry. The old guys. Ricardo is old. So what we have to understand is this. We're, we're, we're at the end. We're just like, that fourth verse means a lot to us on 10,000 things. Yeah, Ricardo's coming out like this. <laughs> That's what he's doing. Here's, here's what we realize. Hezekiah prayed, got more time, but fumbled the ball. He didn't make it count, didn't redeem the time. I have to tell you this story. Singers, you come on out. Come on, singers, come out, then we're gonna close. The organization that, that God used to touch college campuses around the country and around the world was Campus Crusade for Christ. Bill Bright was used incredibly. I, I was reading, and, and here's what's amazing. They have tw this man who started from nothing has had 20, 20 before, before he finished well and went home, 26,000 employees, 26,000, 513,000, a half a million volunteers, a half a million volunteers. Can you imagine like we're doing our volunteer gala and like you can't do it. You're going, okay, we got to use Yankee Stadium like 10 times. Like I have to have 10 different meetings. That's how many volunteers they had. He was responsible. I want you to get this. He was responsible for what was put out around the world called the Jesus film. The Jesus film was seen in almost every country of the world by 5 billion people. And they said 138 million people came to Christ because of this movie that was put, this simple movie of the life of Christ, put into 700 languages. And I, and I've been praying. I'm going to tell you this. I didn't even say this before. I'm praying that we can do something like that. I'm praying that we can do something but that, that we can get because this movie that has gone out and it started in the, in the late 80s and then just went out for the last 30 years and I, I'm just believing for God to do something again. So in 2000, Bill Bright was diagnosed with terminal disease. He got his Hezekiah. He got his Hezekiah diagnosis but it wasn't like Hezekiah. I'm reading his book, which is so good. It's, just, it's so important to me. It's called The Journey Home. And he starts off going, this is my final book. I won't be able to write any more books after this. And he's written a hundred books. This is my final one. And this is what he says, I'm dying. And he writes this, he goes, I've been diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. And I'm going to die shortly. And the doctor tells me painfully. And I want to read to you what, what, he, what he wrote in this. So unlike Hezekiah. But in fact, let me just say this. He was diagnosed in 2000. 2000, I think God gave him three years. Three years. You ready for this? I, I went through. I, I, I looked it all up. Um, he wrote 100 books in those three years. With hooked up with oxygen. You know how many books he wrote? 30. 30. Well, we're, we're going like, oh, look at this. I don't know what's going to happen. He goes, okay, let me just say that. He redeemed the time. He redeemed the time. 30.
30 books while he was diagnosed <laughs> with pulmonary fibrosis. Let me read it to you what it said. Bill Bright said, the doctor sat me down one day, Vonette, Vonette, his wife and me in his office and says, you don't seem to realize what's happening to you. You're dying. And he said, the doctor said, it's worse than cancer. It's worse than heart trouble. We can deal with these in some measure, but nobody can help you with pulmonary fibrosis. You are going to die a miserable death. I'm reading this and going like, he has no bedside manners whatsoever. He looked at Bill Bright and said, you need to get your head out of the sand and be prepared for this. So I said, <laughs> this, he said, so I said, well, praise the Lord. Now I get to see God sooner than I thought I would see him. He said, when I, when I heard that I had less than six months to live, I, I focused my attention on the two most important things, my health and the assurance of my salvation. And he said this, I know my last breath is something to look forward to because my next breath after my last breath is seeing Jesus face to face. Let me, let me say that again, because some of you are trying to find your parking receipt. Listen, just listen again. He said, I'm looking forward to my last breath because my next breath after my last breath is me face to face with Jesus. And Bill Bright wrote these words, life is short, death is sure, sin is a cure, curse, and Christ is the cure. Hallelujah. 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 Folks, that's why I'm just telling you, we, we, it's so important today. Stand with me as we finish here. Stand with me. Heaven and hell are not faraway places. Let me say that again. Heaven and hell are not faraway places. It's a breath away. Our last breath leads us to that breath of eternity and heaven and hell are not faraway places that's why this is so important to me it's I'm passionate about this for those that are sitting balcony I'm looking at, at, at so many of you that are here I don't even know what you're doing here it's Memorial Day weekend and almost the balcony is full I'm going like because because here's the issue here's the issue balcony main floor to all the countries that are watching and every state that's watching around the United States listen to me this is life and death now I'm going to ask you in these, okay, here it is. Now, everybody just freeze for just one moment. A prayer team, you can come down because they, they stop. Red shirts, come on down, come on down. They're so obedient. I just go, everybody freeze. They went, come on, come on down. Prayer team. Okay, listen, listen now, listen. You can redeem these next three minutes better than rushing to lunch and getting your car out quick. Some of you are already on your phone going, okay, when's the next, when's the next B and D train? When's the next B and D? Just, just pause. You can wait four more minutes because life and death is involved with this. Remember, heaven and hell are not faraway places. And here it is. Here it comes. You ready for this? Eternity is too long to be wrong. You got to get it right. You have to get it right. You don't know when a phone call comes. You don't know what a day holds. You don't know any of that stuff. As we sing the song, I mean, not, not that we're singing it now, but if you think of what Barry's playing and the team is playing. Every time I, I think that, when, when that final day is coming, and on that day, when my strength is failing, and the end draws near, here's what God's doing. Today's the day to get heaven right. Let me help you with this. Jesus said, Jesus said this, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through me, is what he says. Do you understand what that means? If anybody, here's what he says, then he goes on to say in John 3, 3, they just put it on the screen, you can put it up again. No man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are what? Okay. Look at me for a moment. Around the world, look at me. If anybody ever tells you there's a number of ways to heaven, it's wrong. It's not true. It's, it's, here's what you should respond. If they simply go like, I, 
I've been a good person. I should get there. I've given a lot. I've been there. Okay, you may say that and you're sitting here today. You may be saying that you're online. Here's the part you got to get. You ready for this? Don't miss this. Eternity's too long to be wrong. If you say that there's a different way to get to heaven other than through Jesus and being born again, then my response to you is this. Oh, excuse me. So you must have been there. Because you happen to know the way to a place you've never been. Hmm. I think I'm going to go with Jesus on this because he came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, we lift your name on high. So if if you have a different way to heaven, tell me. Because I'd love to meet you to know what heaven is all about. But here's the fact. You've never been there. So let's go with Jesus on this. Let's go with him. Because you've come up. Here's what you said. If I was to ask you how to get to heaven. Here you was. I've been a good person. I haven't hurt anybody. I'm moral. I treat my wife right. I provide for my family. I haven't killed anybody. Great. Continue on that path. Don't kill anybody. That's not what Jesus said. Well, I'm, I've had a communion. I've been baptized. My parents are religious. Those are all great. That's not what Jesus said. He said, you must be born again. That's what he said. Well, how do I do that, Pastor Tim? Born again is not a Times Square church word. It's a Jesus word. Just as you had a physical birth, a first birth physically, you need a second birth spiritually. Many of you were born in a hospital but you need to be born again spiritually. How does that happen? It's as simple as ABC. A, it's admitting that we're sinners. It starts with going, we're all broken on the inside. I have a condition and it's called sin. I can't fix it with a program, a promise. I can't fix it with a prescription, a pastor, a priest, a mosque. I can't fix it with Times Square Church. I am broken, I'm a sinner. I need help. I'm not, I don't need a second chance. I need a second birth. Well, how does that happen? That's the B word. B, believe. Believe that God sent his son 2,000 years ago to die in my place. He would become my sin bearer and come to die the death I was supposed to die. Live the life that I couldn't live and give me a reward I don't deserve. Forgiveness and heaven. That's why he came. And finally see, confessing him as Lord, that's what changes it from a religion to a relationship. When you say you're Lord, he's not just Lord on Sunday when you show up at church, he's Lord on Monday. Man, listen, and you ready for this? Let me ruin your weekend. He's Lord on Friday nights. You don't, get, you don't sit there and go, Jesus, I'll, see, when you, only, when you only serve Jesus when you come to church, that's dating Jesus. Jesus is not interested in you dating him. He wants full covenant marriage to him. That's what he wants. Stop dating him. Give your life to him. Heaven and hell are not faraway places. Eternity is too long to be wrong. Give your heart to Jesus today. Be born again today. You ready for this? Redeem the time. Redeem the time today and say, Christ, come into my life. And I'm telling you what's going to happen. All of your time changes then. Your whole life changes at that moment. Pastor Tim, how do I do it? I'm going to pray a born again prayer. A prayer that can begins to affect not just your time here, 70, 80, 80 plus years. It'll affect your eternity. If you're willing to give your heart to Jesus today, every head up, every eye looking, those that are watching around the country and around the world, it can start today. I'm going to pray a born again prayer that says, God, this is the best decision I can. It's the most important decision you can ever make in your life because eternity is at stake. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, put me in. I want God to come into my life and change me. If that's you, hold up your hand as high as you can. I want to make sure I see every hand. Keep them up high. Yes, 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 yes. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. There, 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 there. All the way in the back. Yes, 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 yes. Balcony, keep your hands. I want to make sure I can see them, that they're up. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, got you there. Come on, let's thank God for what he's going to do and what he's doing in their lives. Can we all pray this right now? Come on, say this with me. Everybody, dear Lord Jesus, 
I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Okay, say this loud now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And say this, heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen, and amen, and amen, and amen. Hallelujah.